Welcome to This Is Your Life. I'm literally on the run to surprise our guest of honour tonight. This is about the time that he leaves the recording studios and I'd uh, hate to have to try and surprise him out there in all that Topeka traffic. Right now he's here at the Paradise Recording Studios with Julie Anthony playing a composition that he has just written for her. He is one of those fantastic Australians who makes stars. Of course he's a star himself, he's a singer, an actor, a musician, a star maker, a hit maker. I'm sure that seeing him again will bring back a whole host of memories. It's kind of surprising. We'll just have to get started. We can't wait for longer, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, but I think you've about finished in here, haven't you? Hello, Julie. Hi, Roger. How are you? How are you? All right? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Well, I'm sorry to be It's getting very late. You realise that, don't you? Hi, Roger. How are you? Hello, Rob. How are you? Oh, fine, thank you. Surprised to see you, man. Yeah, I'm surprised to see you, too. Even more surprised, I hope, because <laughs> Robbie Porter, this is your life! <laughs> tonight is Reg Lindsay, winner of the Country Music Award with Empty Arms Hotel, a song you brought back from the United States and produced for him, and also your friend Gary O'Callaghan, Mr. Radio himself. Thank you very much, fellas. Thank you. And Robbie, your first surprise is coming through those doors right now. <laughs> Now, John, John, I know, of course, uh, before, but hang on, I've got something to show you before we go any further. Do you happen to recognise this photograph over here? On the good-looking one on the left. You sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have pretty good one on the right. <laughs> well, I do know that you two happen to go to school together at Fort Street, isn't that correct, John? That's right, mate, yeah. And I got dudded out of the school swimming blue, mate, by Robbie. I've got no one, not one kind word to say about him. I know well, why he's riding this bike. Why you, is that, You mate? can tell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you remember. The school swimming blue is something you put in your pocket, you're right. very proud of. I won the uh, championship at school, and you could have a a seven-day challenge race. And I lived in Enfield and he challenged me within seven days. So I had to ride my bike from Enfield to Cabarita Pool seven miles. I'm pedalling there for the challenge race. On the way past goes Robbie Porter and his dad in their flash car. <laughs> I'm pedalling like that. We get to Cabarita, his father starts the race. Falsely in my opinion. His father judged the race, which I won clearly. <laughs> Gives the championship to him, he gets the school blue. And I was expelled. That's <laughs> Robbie, it's really you. fantastic to see you. It's really good to see you doing so well. <laughs> if I won the blue, this could have been my life. You could have been a guest. <laughs> well, John, I know that you've got your own show to get to, so you better pedal away, I guess. Okay, Thanks for mate. being with us tonight. John Singleton! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Robbie, listen to this. Yes, Robbie, the singer who is on top of the Australian charts, Colleen Hewitt. <laughs> Colleen, will you tell us about your current hit? I would love to, Roger, because, uh, well, several months ago, I recorded a song called Dreaming My Dreams with You, and at that stage, I didn't have a recording contract. And Danny, my manager, sent it over to Robbie, who was in Los Angeles at the time. And a few weeks went by, and we didn't hear anything, and all of a sudden, we got a phone call. And it was Robbie saying, hold everything, don't make a move, I'm coming out there soon, and I'd like to put you out on Wizard. And we waited, and he came, and he did. Someday I'll get over you. I'll live to see it all through. But I'll always miss dreaming my dreams with you. Colleen Hewitt, we thank you. 
OK, Robbie, you are a hit maker for others now, but in the 1960s you are a star yourself in your teens. Let's take a look at you on Bandstand. Heather Sweet Thing. I love you, honey, love you, honey, love you. You're for me. Oh, here's the girl. <laughs> Let's turn the clock back now, right the way back to World War II, Robbie. You were born Robert George Porter on a winter's morning in June 1941, the only child of Maury and Doreen Porter. Your father, a RAAF PT instructor based in parks, puts on dances for the troops in parks where you spend your early years. And let's take you back to the time when you said... He's making a funny sound, Daddy. That, of course, is your father, Maury Porter, and with him, your mother, Doreen. <laughs> Maury, Robbie said that to you at the age of two. Now, what was the funny sound? Rob would always sit at the back uh, the hall, right down near the band, or the front of the hall, and uh, one night I was there running the dance, and he said, that's a funny sound, Dad. I checked at the break after, and uh, with the band leader, and one of the musicians were out of tune, and I said, there you are, there's an ear for music. <laughs> when Rob was eight years old, a gentleman came to the door and he asked if I had any children I would like to have taught the guitar. So I had Rob take a course at the School of Music and later on he began to play by ear. And when he was about 11 or 12, he started learning music again at Nicholson's in the city. And that was just the beginning of it, yes. eh? Can I say something, just in case we don't have another opportunity? Um, I've had an incredible chance that I don't know that many people get, but anything that I wanted to do without being a spoilt child or anything, I think that my parents have been totally behind me, and my choice to go into music rather than law, which I started with, was never met with any kind of argument, and they backed me all the way, and it's that reason why I've done what I've done. And I thank you very much. Well, and I'm I want to take you back now, Robbie, to the age of 11. Do you remember this voice? If you practiced a little more, you would be better than you are. Roy Royston. That's right. That's right. That's quite right. The voice of a guitar player and teacher who is a legend all throughout Australia to musicians. Your tutor from Nicholson's, as you say, Roy Royston. <laughs> you study at Lord City University and you play at university dances. And then comes a turning point in your life, Robbie. November the 20th, 1959, you present yourself to the unforgettable Johnny O'Keefe. He likes what he hears, and he features you on Six O'Clock Rock. You call yourself Robbie G, and you cut your first record, Cheating Heart. Hey, Rob, do you fancy a quick drive up to Brisbane's Story Bridge Hotel? Yes, an old friend of yours, former disc jockey Graham Webb, known then as Spider, Spider Webb. Webb. The old cheating <laughs> Fishing up Disneyland, that trip, my kids loved it, thank Great. you. Great. Graham, um, what do you got there? Uh, well, back in the late 50s, all the disc jockeys at that time sort of ran me down a little because I always played the Aussie artist records. That's and right. not only did I play them on air, I loved to save them. And I saved your very first record, Rob. This one, uh, Your Cheatin' Heart. I also saved Cold Joys and Lucky Stars and uh, uh, Johnny O'Keefe's, but it was just marvellous, and I've, st I've still got them in my record collection. And that's it, your cheating And you're heart. giving it to me now, right? I, uh, no <laughs> way, my, that's got to, no, no way. That's going to be worth a lot of money, even if only for blackmail. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Creator <laughs> 7 Sound Unlimited, <laughs> Graham Wack. OK, well, Robbie, you give up law to make music your career, and 1960 is certainly a gala year for you. You play in the clubs on all the current television shows and hit the top ten with the composition Whiplash. Hi there, Rob. Remember the Carolee Hotel in Kingaroy? That's right. Carl like Joy! <laughs> Thank 
I am not saying anything. Yes, neither am I. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Carl, now, first of all, Carl, the Kingaroy Hotel is in Queensland. What were you doing? Oh, we, we were on tour, Roger. We've got many happy memories of a lot of the gang in the old days, and, uh, and I especially remember Robbie's tours up through Queensland, and especially uh, on the way home through Kingaroy and other places. Um, most Trying enjoyable. To push I don't up, think yeah. I don't think Robbie will forget them. Let's forget. Let's say that much, and, and I'm sure that I won't. It's certainly it's a part of uh, a big part of my life. And uh, I'm pleased that Robbie shares a part of my life. Carl Joy, thanks for being with us. And I a part of his. Thank you, Carl. Carl Joy. Robbie, by the end of 1960, all of 18 years of age, you have a fan club, the DJs are playing your music, you have a rock star system, but as we shall see, the road to success is not really quite that simple. <laughs> Nineteen sixty-one starts as a boom year with a flood of bookings, but in February of that year, fate delivers one of its cruel blows, one that affects your life to this day. On the corner of Ernest and Miller Street in Camaray, Sydney, en route to a bandstand recording, you're in a car accident. It leaves you with a fractured neck and spine. It's doubtful if you'll ever walk again, but luck and determination get you up. In a few months, supported by a brace from neck to waist, worn under a specially made suit, you are playing your guitar once again. It's specially mounted for you tabletop style, and you get yourself an engagement in surface paradise as the beast comb. But in 1962, 63, 64, Robbie is voted the most popular recording artist in Australia. That's your good friend, former manager and star maker, that's right, Jack Neary. In 62, you take Robbie over as a pop star and make him into a top variety entertainer. Will you tell us about him and how you launched him overseas? We put him into Andre's nightclub, and I think at that stage you were the youngest teenager to ever play a nightclub as an entertainer. I thought he was ready for the uh, more variety field of the theatre, and so uh, I sent him across to Perth uh, to Her Majesty's Theatre where he played with Diana Dawes yes, and, and Ruth, Ruth Wallace. Wallace. That's right. And uh, I got in touch with a great organisation through a, a good friend and my representative, Silver Berlin, who then, Robbie, went and the rest is history. It sure is, and Jack Neary, thanks for telling us about the beginning of that history tonight. Thank Jack you, Neary. Thank you very much. recognised as one of Australia's top guitarist composers. Two hits follow each other, 55 Days to Peking and When You're Not Here. Then, of course, it's off to London. You are re-recording When You're Not Here for English release when you are heard by a man who changes the course of your life. Here on film from Los Angeles, Lou Futterman. Hello, Robbie. Do you remember that December afternoon in 1965 at Olympic Recording Studios in London? Three months later, I had brought you to New York, and you had a recording contract with a major company, and lots of big plans for the future. I guess a lot of the plans didn't work out quite the way you expected, but they worked out quite well, didn't they? Well, Robbie, it's New York for you. Had a three-year recording contract with MGM Records. Oh, Danny boy. Well, Rob, it only took me 13 years to learn that from you, and 14 years to finally get down here. Yes, no Robbie, kidding. This Is Your Life has flown him from Hollywood, former MGM and Paramount executive, seven-time Emmy award-winning producer, George LaMare. <laughs> I hope you say something better than you did. <laughs> George... You first met Robbie Porter in 1966, I believe. That's right, Roger. I think uh, Lou brought you into the office at Metro. We That's had right. lunch, and uh, you played some uh, sample discs in those days, and I think I felt then, as most of uh, the associates at Metro, that you were going to be a major star. And you didn't disappoint any of us. You went on to uh, produce and record, and I think, well, several singles for the Metro label, and uh, Rob also carved a marvelous acting career up in Hollywood, starred in some features, with, one with James Coburn, the Carey Treatment at Metro, and a television series. And I'm 
I think this evening of recognition is so deserved, and I wish for you uh, that you'll share with us these God-given talents, these unique talents, and that you'll always be as caring and loving and giving as you are now. I love you. Thank you, man. Of my son. Now, Robbie, to help with your acting career, George Lemaire suggests that you study with the famous Vincent Chase workshop. What a dump! Somebody very special, your wife Jill. <laughs> Jill, when you were referring to what a dump, you weren't talking about Channel 7, I hope. Oh, no, Roger, I wasn't. Uh, Robbie and I did a scene together in class, which was Virginia Woolf, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? That was one of the famous lines from it. We've been rehearsing it ever since, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but when we were in Vincent Chase's class, I had heard of Robbie before I even met him. It's because Vincent used to use Robbie's records, like Oh Danny Boy, as an example to all of us young actor and actresses, to show us that you could sell a song as an actor and the words would mean something. So that's where I'd heard of him. Meantime, would you care to sit with him now as we tell the rest of his story? Thank you, Jill, very much. Thank you. Here's a photograph of your wedding. Now that must be your best man to the left, I suppose. Uh, who is he, Robbie? Les Gock. Les Gock, of course, is the lead guitarist of a band that you discovered and molded into superstars called Hush. <laughs> They've assembled together tonight for just one more occasion, this one, and here they are right now, Chris Palethorpe, Keith Lamb and Les Gock, Hush! <laughs> Robbie, in 1967, you finally get your green card and you're able to work full-time in the United States. In all this time, acting and singing, you find yourself encouraging Australian talent in frequent trips back home. To promote them in the States, you team up with an American producer-director. On film from Hollywood, your former partner, Steve Binder. Hi, Robbie. This is Steve Binder in California. I'm really sorry I can't be with you on this uh, auspicious occasion of This Is Your Life. Uh, in all seriousness, I can't think of anybody that America can be more grateful to uh, for showing us and letting us see and hear Australian artists than you. And I think Australia as well owes you a great uh, deed of gratitude and thanks for letting us uh, tune in for the first time to artists like Daddy Cool and Rick Springfield and Russell Morris. And uh, for that, we'll always be grateful. Good luck to you, Robbie. Robbie, how do you see Australian artists faring in the United States in the 80s? I think the door is open. Uh, if they've got it together before they go over there, I think that um, you have to have everything planned up front. We've got a lot of great talent here. We've got a lot, a, lot of, a lot of great singers and performers, and I think we just have to give them encouragement, and when they go over there, keep the encouragement going. Thank you, it's Robbie, for your encouragement. Too. From the early 70s, Robbie, you have your own record label, Wizard Records, which has produced an unusual number of hits. In fact, currently there's a very talented group whom you brought to the threshold of international success. Right now in America's top 100 and rising on the cash box chart, Air Supply. <laughs> I know that because here they are right now, Air Supply! <laughs> How about it, ladies and gentlemen, Air Supply! Well, Robbie, when we, when we think of Wizard Records, 
we think of this singer. Something's missing in my life. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's you and me. Marsha Hines! Marsha, Robbie writes songs for you and produces your records. Would you tell us how you two first came to team up? Uh, we met uh, during a uh, performance of Jesus Christ Superstar, and uh, we had a Chinese meal. That's and right. we talked about uh, me being a singer. What can you tell us about it? Um, my relationship with Robbie's been very much like a marriage. And uh, <laughs> uh, we fight a lot. And um, he's very important to me in my life. Very sentimental, and uh, I we have a lot. A lot I of love him. We fight. Yeah, we fight a lot. We have some good times, and Jill's good too. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you'd like to sum him up by? Something you'd like to say? Um, you did say at one point he's amazing, and that's all I can say. We fight, but he is amazing. <laughs> we fight, but he's amazing. Yeah. Marsha Hines, so are, you, so are you. The incomparable Marsha Hines. Well, Robbie, there's, there's just one major event that we've not yet mentioned. It happened on January the 29th, 1978. Your son, Christopher, is born, and here he is. <laughs> Robbie, the boy who won our hearts, says Robbie G, with his talent and his courage, and won a place for himself in America the hard way, has accomplished all these things as a very young man. The rest of your life will fill a room full of music and another book like this. Robbie G. Porter, this is your life. Thank you. Thank you. Airbus Airlines.